Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Return of the Show. I am Ben, and I am here with my co-host today, Alex, and we are talking about The Last of Us. In particular, we're going over the newest and fourth episode of this series, Please Hold My Hand. Uh, Alex, how are you feeling after watching this, and also, how are you feeling about the fact that we have another episode like this Friday now that we have to deal with. <laughs> I know everything online is like, oh my gosh, yes, we get an episode sooner. And then it's like, oh yeah, it's going to be, I think, nine days between episode five and episode six. Oh, uh, no. Oh, you. So. Okay. Now I like it less. I was like, <laughs> yay, it's going to be here so soon. I forgot about delayed gratification. That's, uh. Yep. Okay, well, we'll deal with that, and of course, that episode has been delayed because HBO does not want to compete with um, the Super Bowl, which uh, I, I'm not quite sure, can I say Super Bowl, or do I have to say the big game? I forget what the NFL's rules be behind that are these days. Um, You know, I'm not sure, Ben. You know, I'll look it up, and if you heard me bleep <laughs> it through the podcast, then you know I can't say Super Bowl. Um, the game that comes after the Puppy Bowl. Exactly. You know what? That's a great way for us to put it. We No more big game, only post puppy ball game. Uh, but anyway, speaking of cute things, we got to talk about uh, Joel and Ellie because th this was a wholesome episode. The, the, this one, this one had me feeling very comfy with the characters and like it really feels like we're starting to slide into Joel and Ellie as an actual duo within the story. Um, yes, nothing like a buddy road trip movie to really expound on character traits. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, the pun book is, like, for me, the definition of, like, just childlike wonder. And, like, Ellie, Ellie's a teenager. I forget how old she is canonically She's 14. In this. She's 14 in this. Yeah, but like that's that's like the perfect like fourteen year old thing, especially bugging the father figure, or in this case, her caretaker, um, soon to be father figure. I'd expect, but like the dynamic between the two of them, and the fact that every joke she says, you can always see Joel turned away, but just cracking a little bit of a smile. Yeah, I mean, it really is just kind of a like kids are kids. Uh, even in the worst of times, like kids are still going to find puns funny. It makes me think of when <laughs> I was 14, I definitely enjoyed pun books as well. Like, I feel like those are actually kind of big when I was like uh, that age, maybe a little younger. Um, yeah. And it, it kind of also sets us up for later in the episode when Joel's um, kind of really grappling with just how much it sucks for Ellie to be a kid in this time and how unfair it is and how bad he feels. Um, so we kind of set that ball up by having her just kind of be a kid and be a typical teenager. She's like, oh, coffee smells bad. And she, I'm not tired. Immediate cut to she's asleep in the car. It's just like such typical like 14-year-old things. Yeah. Um. And if, I'm sure, of course, it reminds him of his daughter as well. And that, again, e even though she could not be more different from his daughter, she's still a, a kid. I think one of my favorite things apart about this is actually the fact that, like, you can tell some of those moments from of concern based off of, like, still some of the more wholesome interactions that he has with her. So, like, uh, the very funny and notorious finding the porn comic in the car. Um, which people on Twitter were wondering if we weren't going to get that, and uh, we got it. But the Joel's reaction is like, you're a child, you're not supposed to be looking at that. He's still full-blown <laughs> treating her like a kid. Like, the apocalypse <laughs> has not changed how he views children in this instance, and, like, having that just be, like, in a moment which is way less dire than shooting someone later in the episode but is still, like, a thing that, like, a good adult would be like, hey, no, put that down. You're not supposed to have that. Like, Yeah, I'm imagining he's like, oh, my God. Like, he doesn't know what, how much she knows about, like, sex or anything like that. He's probably like, oh, God. And it's a, like, it's a gay men's porn also. Um, which, obviously, you know, she's 14. She's not six. So, yeah. uh I love the joke about, oh, why are these pages all stuck together? It's just, it's, uh, 
<laughs> it's so good. And that was in the game. Oh my God, it's so funny. Yeah, I, I watched the like side to side. Like they almost actually, what's really impressive is the fact that Bella Ramsey was told not to play the games or watch any gameplay footage, but she almost completely nails it even in delivery when you compare those two sides together. Like it's, first of all, in order for that to happen, it has to be really, really, really good directing in order to get similar performances out of the out of different actors with different directors. That's a that's really well done. Um, and they just absolutely nailed like maintaining that scene when you look at the side by side, which is just another aspect of like how good of an adaptation this is and how much respect it has for the source material. But like it's the entire scene just plays itself so fun. And especially after last episode where we all spent the last week crying, this was a nice refresher. Yeah. Um, And this episode was plenty dark. And by dark, (laughs) I mean literally dark, classic HBO. I was like, when are we going to get an episode that I can barely see half of it? Here it is. (laughs) Uh, I was like, Jesus Christ, let me turn up my fucking brightness, I guess. I don't know. (laughs) All the blacks are like gray. I'm like, I can't say anything. I don't know what it is with HBO and um, how they do their color correction. But like everyone complained about it in Game of Thrones, but it was there before Game of Thrones. And I feel like whatever HBO has going on in like their post-production rooms is like they're just assuming that people have really, really good TVs with really deep <laughs> blacks in order to we contrast. We don't. No, <laughs> if you if you have like a TV that is that doesn't have like I think it's called True Black. I forget. I'm I'm not a monitor. I'm a video editing person, but I'm not a monitor person. I don't know every single monitor that there is out there. I do know that certain TVs you'll be able to see the contrast better. I have a um I have a TV that was passed down to me that has that kind of contrast, so I was fine for that episode. But then when I pulled it up on my uh computer just now to look at shit, I I, I can't tell what's going on. This is this page is black. This page is black. It's dark. It's very dark. <laughs> it's the, and like I I will say there is something to say about low light shooting and making it look good. But yeah. HBO, I think they need to, I mean, talk about HBO has been a little out of touch ever since the uh, time, not the time war, the Discovery merger. There's been too many mergers with fucking HBO, but they I don't think it's going to get better. I, I think they're just going to be like, you pores need better televisions and they're just going to keep it like this. And th- that's how life is going to be. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I I honestly, it really only bothered me at the end of the episode, the part um, where they're, like, sleeping out in the woods. Um, One, I think it was not quite as dark. And then I just, I don't know, something about it didn't bother me as much. Because, well, one, because there was no action happening. Yeah. Um, It was mostly dialogue. Uh, But, yeah, I mean, and that's another great character moment. You know, Joel is planning on driving for a long, long time, a long, long Long time, time. (laughs) uh, the next day. And so he needs to get some rest. And yeah, I mean, you kind of get, he could easily tell her when she asks, like, is anybody going to come after us? Like, I, you know, he could be real with her, but he's like, no, No. it's not going to happen. And then he stays up. Um, Yeah. Which... For me, like, what I saw in that moment to contrast between the two scenes was this was Joel, like, still being on edge. And then later in the episode, when he actually does fall asleep and Henry gets the drop on him, I see that as him having let his guard down specifically because of Ellie. Where beforehand, like, even in that scene, Joel was pretty resistant to a lot of Ellie's questions. Like, a lot of answers that he was giving were like pseudo one word but at the same time like he would eventually let things slip like he's still really guarded early on in the episode and then by the end of the episode like you can tell that he's totally dropped it around ellie especially like him laughing at the final pun before falling asleep 
Yeah, I mean, I think some of it too is also he must be absolutely exhausted. He also almost gets killed, which I'm sure (laughs) is is quite exhausting. Um, And they have him falling asleep on his right side. Um, But when Ellie wakes him up at the end of the episode, he's switched. So he's sleeping on his left side. And as she points out right before they go to sleep, he can't hear very well on his right side. That's a really good detail. Oh, I missed yeah. that. Oh. Yeah, yeah. he's sw- he's on uh yeah, he's sleeping on his good ear basically. So that's probably why he doesn't hear them coming in. Um which I will also find out per it's possible they just didn't even come through that like glass that they laid down. Um but I just thought that was a pretty interesting detail. And another thing with, you know, um Ellie's really, really smart and observant and um, just like another great detail that she picked up. That's uh, honestly, I'm really surprised that you caught that. I The entire time I was like, wow, Joel went through so much trouble, like get like laying out all that glass, making sure it was completely booby trapped so he'd wake up and he totally slept right through it. And I just assumed it was because he was so exhausted that. It didn't wake him up, but that. Yeah, that's I went really back and looked because I was like, because uh, I picked up when she was saying that, that he was sleeping on his right side and facing the door. Um, and then when they cut to him, he's sleeping on his right side. So that's part oh, of it, too. Jeez. He's a, he's a side switcher, you know? Yeah, he 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 rolls in bed. Everyone let it be known. Pedro Pascal, if if you share a bed with him, he'll roll around. He will not God be bless. stationary. <laughs> Well, uh, on less fun notes, uh, Ellie kind of killed a man today. Um, this is, yeah. I, I, I feel bad for her in this scene. And I will say the one thing that I do like about this scene on a meta note is we can all stop having the weird debate on the internet on if Ellie is a monster or not in this adaptation. Yeah. I, yeah. We talked about this in the last one where people are like, she's deranged she likes hurting people and i'm like i don't think that's it at all uh that'd be really weird (laughs) really weird direction for this to go in um and yeah i think they did a really phenomenal phenomenal job directing uh that part of the episode because it's action-packed but they really took their time with that um so You know, they're driving along, there's a block on the highway, they have to get around it, they're all turned around, because Ellie can't read a map, which I can't (laughs) either, so I really feel for her. (laughs) Um, And they are ambushed, and um, yeah, I think it, so something that happens in the games that people always talked about, and they continue it in this, is You know, when they're fighting people and people are getting hurt, the um, antagonists are calling each other by name, which is not something you usually have in video games. Like, they're just kind of the bad guys. Um, And so they obviously expounded on that in this episode by having, um, I believe it's Brian. Yeah. Yeah, that's so... That was really hard to watch. You felt really bad for him because it's also like the more he talks, the more you're like, oh, this kid's probably like 17, 18, like yeah. really not even that much older than Ellie, it seems like. And uh, it's so brutal. It's so brutal. Uh, the entire time, like, because from Ellie's perspective, she even – um you can see her lowering the gun before she shoots him. So like she actively decided not to shoot him somewhere where it would have immediately killed him. Um, yeah. It, she wasn't going to do a headshot. Um, it not, e- she wasn't even going to go like through the uh, like chest cavity through the back. Like it seems like she hit him somewhere low and like it wouldn't have finished him off. He would have been able to leave, but uh, the, it, the entire thing is like, they preserve it really well, and the scenes up until that, like, when Joel downs the first person, like, he gets called a son of a bitch for it. I forget if they actually call out that person's name. Yeah, they do. And they, yeah, you can hear them, like, reacting. It, their friend just got killed. And so it really does give, you know, it's not just these, 
And I mean, the whole point of this episode is expanding on this, what in the game is kind of just like gameplay and giving faces. And they talk about in the post episode about really giving faces to this group. Um, And I mean, that is also just so interesting. The idea that kind of what the Fireflies are trying to do, this team in Kansas City actually did it. Yeah. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Now it sounds like they're maybe not quite as noble or... Uh, as the fireflies, I I don't even know if I would go that far because it seems it, it seems sounds like, like the Kansas City Fedra was pretty fucked up, and uh, so this is kind of the comeuppance. The, yeah, the counterculture to that was people truly taking over Fedra and killing everyone, um, and so it's interesting to see that in this world, we just came from a world where these people are trying to take over Fedra and these people did it, but are obviously very ruthless. They're willing to kill people that are just passing through, um, for supplies. Yeah. And I just feel really, um, I just feel really bad for honestly everyone in this, but like Joel is put in a really strange position of the fact that like he kind of has to finish this kid off for Ellie because yeah. Ellie didn't actually kill him. But from which I was also as I'm watching it, I'm like, I'm like, ah, well, it sounds like she hit his spine. He's not gonna make it uh, in a post-apocalyptic world with no legs. I mean, just <laughs> it's you know. She eh? didn't finish the job. Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, I'm like, you know, he's not gonna... His quality of life has gone down really <laughs> low. It's time to just end it. Yeah, it's... Uh, uh, unfortunately, for lack of a better analogy, it reminds me a lot of, like, you hear stories about people, like, their first time hunting as, like, kids, and their dad takes them out to go hunt. This is a bad analogy. I'm not a... I don't want to close this to hunting, but, like, killing it, like, shooting an animal, accidentally maiming it, and then, like, the dad has to go, like, oh, we have to kill it now. Like, and it's going to suffer in this moment, which is essentially what happened, but with a human being. Um, Yes, that's a horrible analogy, but... One of the things that, like, I took away away from that is, uh, first of all, like, Joel trying to comfort her and uh, not really doing a good job. He ends up divulging that he was also a part of, like, raiding parties like this at the time. And apparently, of course, this gets added on to the fact that he was in a raiding party with Tess, um, which... If there's one thing that we know about Joel, one of his main rules is we don't ever, ever bring up Tess. And she brings it up. Yeah. And I mean, it. they were pretty clear that they were not saints and they did what they needed to survive. Um, and that's part of the reason he immediately knows they've fallen into a trap when that guy is um, in front of the car. Uh, yeah. And I just to go back to like the direction of the episode they it's an action-packed scene with a shootout um and a car accident and then they really take their time with um ellie like just seeing ellie walk over make the decision to shoot this guy she also has her knife on her like that's her first instinct instinct she's not used to a gun um and then I'm sure also for her, she kind of thought, like, she was going to kill him. She's surely not expecting, like, yeah, now I'm going to have this guy who is begging for his life. That's pretty horrible, too. Yeah. Um, And then just having to – she doesn't put up a fight at all when Joel tells her, like, go back in the other room. She kind of scuttles away right away because she realized, you know, this is fucked up and I don't want to see this. Yeah, and, well, one of the other things that, like, for me is that she said that this was not her first time. Um, now, the way that it was scripted, it sounded like the subtext was that it wasn't her first time killing someone, but the actual text would have implied that it was her first, that it wasn't her first time uh, shooting someone. Hurting. Or, or hurting. hurting someone, yeah. I think, is the words you use. Um, Yes. I'm not going to speculate on here what we're going to go into, um, but I think I I, I kind of have an idea of who she's talking about, which uh, it's going to be so fucking sad when we see that. Um, 
It's really going to suck. I'm uh, not looking forward to the Ellie flashback now, like, because we know oh, that yeah. she's been in a military school. We know that she potentially a cover story of hers is that she snuck into a place and then got bit there. And she may have been with some other people at the time. So, like, these are the only things I know. And I imagine that's how the setting is going to come together. I'm- yeah. See, the, this is your gut. <laughs> I'm I have a a pretty educated assumption about what she's talking about, but I think it would be pretty interesting if we saw more of the military school, because I'm imagining that shit is also pretty uh, I, tough. I pretty would, tough. <laughs> I would love to know what's going on with uh, Fedra military school. Like, the fact that, like, Joel handed her a gun and was like, do you know how to use it? And essentially gave her a um, practicum test on how to use a firearm. <sighs> Yeah, I mean, she was. makes it. I really liked that episode, the like scene earlier where she's like pointing the gun in the mirror because, again, it really does seem like this is just a kid who got a gun, but it's not her first time holding a gun. Well, um, which you would expect she knows how to hold a gun. She's at a military school. Yeah. Um. Well, that was actually my takeaway was um that she knew how to correctly unload it. She knew how to use a proper grip, like, right away. Uh, like, the only thing that Joel had was, like, a quick grip correction for her. But, like, otherwise, like, finger was off the trigger. She was able to unload and empty the chamber. Like, that's not stuff that you would expect someone who's never held a gun in their life to be able to do. And even then, you wouldn't expect someone that has just had, like, a passing experience of firearms to be able to know how to unload and empty a chamber. So, yeah, and also in this world, it's not like she's watching TV or movies where you're seeing people holding guns all the time. So the only time she's seen guns are in real life. Yeah. So I, I'm looking forward to the gel. Oh, my God. I'm looking forward to the Ellie flashback. Um, I nearly put gun and Ellie together for jelly. That's what was going on with that phonetic break. Um, but I, I'm looking forward to the flashback. I also know that it's going to make me cry. Um, i so yeah. we're, we'll see about that. I have a feeling based off of how everyone keeps talking about the show that it is just <laughs> it's going to be riding a fine line between storytelling with zombies and trauma porn. And I, 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 I'm simultaneously excited and terrified for it. Yeah, it's going to be good. But let's move on to um, my girl, Kathleen. <laughs> because let me tell you one I love Melanie Linsky she's fantastic and I think this was an incredibly interesting and honestly great casting for this character I like I get it strong women may we know them may we raise them what the fuck ever she's a rather like reserved kind of very sweet looking person I think that's a very interesting casting for Someone who seems pretty ruthless. I was about to say, she seems, she like, I, I don't know if it's like the casting and other things I've seen her in, but she gives me soccer mom vibes if like none of this had ever happened. Like, I mean, she'd yeah, just be, absolutely. She'd just be she a gentle definitely, soul. Yeah, this isn't somebody who was like in the military or like in some sort of violent position, a cop before all of this happened. She seems forced into this. She's very um, hardened by the death and torture of her brother. Um, And yeah, I just love the way that scene played out with the doctor. Like he's really trying to kind of like, uh, you know, plea for her humanity that he like delivered her. He knows her. And I love the idea that she kind of, like, she hears that there's an issue. She goes out. People are injured. She's like, will they do okay? Like, will they do better if we have a doctor? And they say no. And she's like, okay, I'm going to go back and kill this guy because that's already what I had in my mind. I just stopped for a second. Um, You know, (laughs) I'd like like to interpret that as, like, she's just very, um, I don't know, practical. I've practical yes but at the same time it feels like she has very massive oversights um uh, specifically of course i'm talking about the uh zombie problem infected problem that's happening in the basement 
and she seems yeah. really focused on like Henry, who of course we find out later in the episode really is not the big threat that she's making him out to be, but he is the boogeyman for a lot of her operations. Like the the first thing that we know about her when we meet her is that she's looking for this man. And like, as we're sort of discovering things, we're discovering that Henry's a father throughout this because they find an old hiding zone of theirs. And like, we can see all the drawings that his child Sam has made of like him and his father as superheroes to like try and cope, which like, oh my God, that's, Mm -hmm. that that is so sad, but it kind of leads into the idea of like, this is someone who probably led a revolt that was well deserved against Fedra based off of everything that we have learned about them and especially how they were treating the people in the city, but might be a little bit more out for revenge than actually leading, but at the same time might not be honest about that. So like, you- yeah, I mean, she's definitely leading with this like vengeance for sure. And yeah, but well, so when I say practical, practically it would be, makes sense to keep a doctor alive but her (laughs) end goal uh is just to get rid of everybody who is like a fedra informant or fedra sympathizer i guess i don't know no that's um it's practical on that line absolutely yes she's like do we need a doctor in this moment no okay i'm gonna go back and kill him yeah and it really does just set up the character even though she is soft-spoken and you know, she comes off as, like, could be kind of sweet. Definitely soccer mom. Um, she'll pull but it, put a bullet in your head. Yeah, absolutely. And she'll do it without hesitation. That's the... Mm-hmm. I don't know what it is about her, but I find her much more horrifying than um, uh, other villains that we've met because you can, you can understand what's happening. Like, you understand the human side of what's happening with what in the game would have just been a group of raiders. But in this, they are a newly freed quarantine zone. Now, we can see the problems with freeing a quarantine zone and the fact that it doesn't seem to be very organized. And obviously, there's this bubbling problem just right below the city that um, her second in command, I forget his name, but I know that he was the voice actor for Tommy. um, Uh, Perry. Perry, thank you. Yeah, her second in command is like, oh, we got to figure out how to deal with this. Should we evacuate? And she's entirely too focused on Henry to deal with this. And of course, um, like from a narrative standpoint, this is going to blow up. But also, I feel like uh, this is there. there's a lot of things that this equates to. Of just like if if there's a rat infestation in your home you might want to call an exterminator or like if a building is being condemned, you might want to get all the people out, which I think is probably a better analogy. Yes. Uh, Yeah, it's, she's a little, she can't see the forest for the woods. She's so focused on getting Henry and because she feels like she's right on his trail, she doesn't want to let that go, even though there's clearly a bigger issue at hand. Um, so we're going to see how that plays out for her. Oh, probably not well. Of course, I have to ask the big question now, because we've had so much lead up to this character. Who is Henry in all this? Because, like, she makes him out to be a boogeyman. But, like, the fact is, is that, like, once she once Joel falls asleep, we finally meet him and Sam and they're in hiding. They are not like in positions of power. They don't have people following them. What real power does he even have? Or is this just a manhunt for like vengeance at this point? Like what did he do and what threat does he possibly still pose? Yeah. And it's funny too, because Joel kind of makes such a big deal about Ellie being a kid. And it's so unfair that she has to like know how to even use a gun and then the episode ends with a kid holding like a much smaller kid holding a gun in his face yeah. it's it's um, uh, poor poor sam and i'm like sam you can tell from the drawings you can tell from everything else is still still a kid 
Like, this is, it's not like you knew that this was a small child from all the lead up that we had building up to it. And the fact that he even has this, like, mask painted on his face, Mm -hmm. like, that just adds to, I don't want to call it horror because it's more emotional than that. Like, there's something deeply profound and sad about It's so dystopian. Yeah, it's, I, like, seeing that image and it's just like, that's a choice that Henry had to make is my son is allowed to have a gun. And, yeah, and, like, has to uh, know how to yield. Like, he's got to help me out. Yeah, and the entire time, it seems like even Kathleen knows that Sam would be Henry's top priority. And I feel like what we're going to end up with is another surprise, surprise foil to Joel and Ellie via this actual um, father and son duo, which uh, yeah. I, I have a feeling this is going to end very poorly and very sadly, but... Just based off of all the setup that we've had, this is all set up for tragedy. I I don't know if I see these characters making it out of uh, this little story arc, unfortunately, which does not make me happy. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we, sh- we will see. <laughs> we will see. It, I- I'm holding out to see like what connections Henry has to Fedra. Because... If he's a Fedra agent, then shit can get really dicey between Joel and him. If he was just, like, an informant, then that changes things drastically. But this is this is all so much. This was, like, a perfect episode of setup for this next story that we'll be going through. And I, I'm just excited for, I guess, Friday. I, I guess we have a couple days before we get some answers. Yep. Very short wait very short all right on that thank you everyone for coming by this week and having to listen along as per usual if you are not already subscribed please do so and rate this podcast wherever you find podcasts we'll see you in the next one and hey it's the return of the show bye Hey, it's Ben here. Haven't done one of these in a while, but just a quick reminder that if you are following, go ahead and make sure you leave us a review on your favorite podcatcher of choice. It does help people find the show. Also, if you haven't already, make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube channel. It is where all of our content is, and we're really close to monetization. Thanks.